Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the podcast. I'm your host, Nick Blevins, and I'm really excited for our interview today. But if this is your first time listening, you might be wondering, what is family ministry? What is, why is it called the family ministry podcast? I just, that's a term that's used a lot of different ways. And so it can be confusing. I use it just to mean children's ministry and youth ministry together. You know, this is a podcast designed for people who serve in one of those two worlds. Or if you're like me and your job requires you to be in both worlds. Um, this podcast is for you. And even if one episode is about youth ministry or about children's ministry, I believe, and I think we've seen that with you know the episodes we've had so far, 90% of the podcast applies to both ministry worlds anyway. And today's is no different. In fact, today's applies to anyone probably that leads in a church because our guest is none other than Carrie Newhoff. And many of you probably listen to Carrie's podcast. If you don't, I'm not sure where you've been. It is my favorite leadership podcast out there. I listen every week. And I've had the privilege of knowing Carrie for a few years, and um, he's just been an incredible influence on me, and I'm sure many of you as well. So I'm excited as we talk to him about his new book, uh, Lasting Impact, Seven Powerful Conversations That Will Help Your Church Grow. And we talk about what does every pastor want from their family ministry staff. You know, so we're always talking about how to lead up and influence our pastors and things like that. But what if we flip that? I think it helps for us to flip that and say, how can we serve our leaders, our executive pastors, our pastors? What do they want from their staff that maybe we don't know or don't realize and forget about? Because if we can do that well, obviously that helps the whole working relationship. So I'm excited to hear from Carrie. But before we jump into the interview, there's one thing I want to tell you about, and that's something called church stratop. And it's a weird word. It's really just a blending of strategic and operating. And it's a process that was created by a guy named Tom Patterson. And now thousands of churches and businesses have used it to create a strategic operating plan for their church. That's where the stratop name comes from. And I know most churches uh, tend to operate with a general sense of direction, you know, not necessarily a specific plan, or maybe they're stuck or there's some things going on. They're not sure you know, how to kind of get out of the specific situation they're in and make some progress and kind of hit their goals and grow and all of that. I know one thing I find in the family ministry world is oftentimes uh, leaders and staff in children's ministry or student ministry are struggling in, in some different ways, but it's it's tied to the overall church. It's not just within that ministry, right? You can't get enough volunteers. And it's not a problem that's unique to that ministry. It's really unique to the whole church. And that's just one. You know, there's plenty of different ways that our churches hit a wall or get stuck or something like that. And Stratop can really help because it's a process that requires the staff to hit pause, which is hard, right? I mean, you're still going to do Sunday and week to week, but you're going to find time to hit pause and work on it instead of just working in it. And this process just walks you through a way to look where you've been, where you want to go as a church, and then what are the steps you're going to take to get there. And it's followed up with... um accountability for that because that happens too. A lot of times we make great plans and then we don't follow through. So it's a really good process. Carrie's church actually had been through a church strat up, a modified version of that a couple of years ago. I remember asking him what was his favorite part. And he talked about just having that outside voice in there with his team, asking questions, you know, kind of guiding that discussion. If that's something that your church would be interested in, you can see more about that in the show notes on my site at nickblevins.com slash episode 23. Or if you just go to nickblevins.com at any point, just click the church strat up link and you can read more about that. Find out what's involved. If you're interested, let me know and we can talk about that. But I think it's really, really helpful. We've done it with our church. We're working off our plan right now and it's a really good thing. And it's really about making time for those important conversations. And that's why I love this book that Carrie wrote, because these are important conversations that sometimes if we're just too busy, we don't have them. And that would be a mistake. They're huge. And so I'm excited for you to hear from Carrie. We talk about a few of them. Obviously, you're going to get the book. But let's jump into my interview with Carrie Newhoff. Well, it's my honor to have Carrie Newhoff on the podcast today. Welcome, Carrie. Hey, Nick. It's great to be with you. I can't imagine many people listening aren't familiar with you and your writing and speaking and all that. But for anyone who is sure, there are lots. <laughs> what's, what, I don't, what's the quick version of your story going from? Because it's a unique, a unique one for sure. Going from lawyer to pastor. 
Yeah, sure. Quick story is uh, I was raised in a Christian home, recommitted my life to Christ at 21, 22. Uh, always wanted to be a lawyer, went to law school. Best thing to come out of law school was my wife, who I met in first year. She was cute. Uh, I noticed that, and we ended up getting married at the end of law school. But in the middle of all that, really, God, like really spectacularly and, and almost supernaturally for a non-supernatural person, intervened in my life, and I began to sense a call to ministry. Didn't know what that meant. Finished law school, articled, uh, got called to the bar, went down to uh, seminary out of obedience right after that. Halfway through seminary, came up to an hour north of Toronto, these three little churches, started ministry here 21 years ago. Haven't left, love these people, love this area. I did switch denominations at 1.9 years ago when I left the work that God was doing in the previous denomination and started brand new, this new church in this area called uh, Connexus Church, which is a North Point strategic partner. Been doing that for nine years. And then um, last year, for the first time in two decades, transferred out of the lead pastor role to become the founding and teaching pastor at Connexus Church to free up a little more time for, you know, teaching and so I could focus more on what I was best at at the church and also to free up a little more time to write, speak, podcast, blog, uh, all of which caught me by surprise when it started to get a lot bigger than I ever thought it would a few years ago. Yeah, I bet. And I guess it's been, what, like a year since you made that transition at Connexus? Almost, yeah. It'll Almost be a year. October. Mm-hmm. And how's it been? I mean, has it been what you'd hoped? And it's. I think it's been great. Uh, I don't know when this is going to air, Nick, but next Friday, I sit down with Jeff Henderson and Jeff Brody, the new lead pastor, and we're going to do like a full hour, whatever, interview on the transition, and it'll be on my pad- podcast this fall. So I may learn some things <laughs> next Friday. That, <laughs> oh, it's not so good at all. But no, Jeff and I get along great. We spent a good chunk of yesterday together. Um, he's doing a fantastic job. Church is healthy. Church is growing, which is what I want. I get to do what I love. And uh, I, I just, you know, I don't look back. I'm not that kind of a person. But man, I'm, I think it was the right time. It was a great move. I think it was great for our church. And it, I think it's been good for me, too. That's great. We were both at Next, uh, something that Orange sure. puts on for Next Gen Pastors or Family Pastors. You were speaking there, and and you got you and, and Jeff was there too, and you gave, kind of gave a little bit of a preview of that, right? Of course, yeah, Reggie surprised him. Reggie Joyner surprised him. <laughs> yeah, it's like Jeff's like, oh, I don't know, they're ready to talk about it. Yeah, it was like it was real new too. I guess it only been a few months or something. Ah, that was what months. February, so it was probably three or four months. But yeah, Jeff Jeff's an incredible leader. Yeah. And you know, when you think about team development, any any seniors listening, uh, senior leaders, <laughs> ask this. Do you have anyone at your team that you would work for? And if not, you need a better team. Um, so now, you know, I hired him, but now technically I work for him, but I'm really thrilled too. I think he's great. He's a great leader. He is. I've learned so much from Jeff. And obviously you guys have visited last year and got to, or maybe it was two years ago. It's hard to remember. Time flies, but got to learn, see your new space, the new building you moved ah. into and learned so much from Jeff. That was a lot of fun. It's really cool. So let me ask this, uh, with all of that has grown in over the last two years, the podcast and your speaking, like you said, the blog, it, it became probably something you never even expected really quickly. What's that been like? Well, yeah, just the biggest surprise ever. I mean, I four years ago, Nick, we're recording this in August. I wasn't a serious blogger. I'd had a blog um, you know, that I was off and on, like, like a lot of bloggers, you know, I do really well in January, but February comes around and <laughs> there's nothing. And then I almost shut it down a few times, but I was releasing a book in the fall of 2012 and I'd read platform and kind of knew you needed your own platform. So I thought, well, I do have this blog. So I just made a commitment to like blog three times a week and set this crazy goal of like a hundred thousand uh, page views in the first year because I knew I'd never hit it, but I needed something to get me out of bed at 5 a.m., so that did it. And uh, I had no idea it would end up being not 100,000, but millions of readers every year. And it's just been such a privilege to be able to connect with so many church leaders and then started the podcast two years ago. And again, one of those things that's been more successful than I thought it would be. And it, it's just it's just been an incredible ride. But uh, the blog, it's an opportunity to express some ideas, sort of the the lab of what we're doing in ministry here and what I'm seeing across the wider church. And then the podcast, for me, like you, is just an opportunity, Nick, to to bring some of my favorite conversations out of, you know, coffee shops and dinner tables and green rooms and 
onto the air where every leader can hear them, which, you know, for years I was having these conversations going, man, I wish everybody could have heard it. And through podcasting now, thank goodness everybody could hear it. And, uh, and it's been great. So it's been, been a real joy. Well, I know I speak for everyone. I say, thanks for doing it. Cause it has been great. I listen every week. I know it's amazing all the places that I can go and talk to people and they listen to your podcast. It's just awesome. Well, there's um, something about podcasting too. Tom Rayner and I were talking about this, Nick, and you, I don't know whether you'll experience or, this or not as your podcast grows and, and becomes, you know, more well known. But like my blog still has two to three times the readers technically than my podcast has listeners. So I'm at 1.3 million downloads. And I mean, that's less than six months on my blog, but it took almost two years to get there yeah. on the podcast. But when I actually go and meet people, if I'm speaking somewhere at an, at an event or like interacting with people, even though the blog is a lot bigger technically than the podcast, people don't talk about the blog nearly as much as they do about the podcast. And, and I think that's because you're in their ears. I think they feel like you're their friend and you come alongside them. So that's been the real surprise. And I mean, the podcast is, is, is growing exponentially, actually. So I'm sure there'll be a day where maybe it eclipses the blog. But, but that kind of intimacy and that kind of like relationship that you build with people through podcasting has been a real surprise to me and, and a lot of fun. I mean, I just that's my favorite part of doing what I get to do is actually interacting with leaders personally. Yeah, me too. And, and it was amazing to me because I do like writing. I don't, probably not as much as you. You're like you're like a content machine, I think. But I do like it. But I definitely like it, interviewing more on the podcast, and it probably is just more fun, a little more relational. And you're right. When I listen to podcasts, most of the people I don't know, and I feel like I know them. Like if I yeah, your buddies. Some, yeah, it's like I could talk to you, and we would. It wouldn't be weird. It wouldn't be awkward. It's totally not true. Probably. I haven't tried that yet, I don't think. Right. So when you see someone at the airport, it's like, yeah, about that trip you made to Colorado last month. Like, how was that, man? <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what is your name? Who are you? Yeah. And what? they're like, wait, wait a minute. What? This is weird. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, before we got on air about Pat Flynn, right? You and I both listened to his podcast. And, yes. Like, I feel like Pat's my best friend, even though I've never met him. Yeah, me too. Well, and part of it is this, and this is for me is something to work on. He had, he, you do this too. You just have your personality comes through, I guess is the best way to say it. And I know for me, and I think he even talks about how early on he hated his first few episodes because of how rough they were. So I feel like that's something that I want to do too is hopefully become more real. Your personality shows and, and people then get to feel like they're right there in the room with you, which is cool. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that is a fun part of doing this. And you know what? Honestly, the podcast is whatever you want to make it. You can change your format tomorrow if you want. Yeah. Right. You, you can do whatever you want. So that's, what's fun about podcasting. Now you may or may not get listeners, but yeah, hey, true. you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I, I love that. I love it. It's the wild west. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. It's so fun, Nick. Yeah. It's getting so much more popular. So you mentioned the you kind of put more focus in your blog uh, four years ago or so with the book. That was Leading Change Without Losing It, right? Yes, that was my book four years ago, Leading Change Without Losing It. Which is great. I highly recommend. I, I don't think you and I have talked about this, but actually at Next, you um, kind of asked who, anybody in the room, were they at the Grow Up Conference at North Point, the last <laughs> one, like 10 years ago or whatever that was, for, and that was a conference for children and student leaders. And I raised my hand because I was there. And that was wow. my first introduction to you. And I'm telling you what, you didn't go into it in your intro here, or at least not in detail. But I think for most people in the room, hearing that somebody could take three small traditional churches, lead them to become one, sell their traditional buildings, go portable, do that whole deal, transition and then launch a church, like all of that, which you hadn't done yet, but the the combining of those churches, it was so much change that I think, and I grew up in a denominational church and I think most of the people in the room did too. So we were just sitting there like, Oh, this is, this is great stuff. How do we get this? Because this is what we want for our churches. So I, t I totally recommend anybody read that book. Uh, but we don't talk about the book you just released this year. Lasting impact. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, a number of months ago released a new book called lasting impact and uh, it's called seven powerful conversations to help your church grow. And then you also released some team edition videos, right? I did. Yeah, and, yeah. And how can a leader use those with the book? Well, the idea was the book, the book was the book, honestly, if I'm telling you the truth, was the book I wrote because I didn't have time to write a book. Um, <laughs> you know, I was still leading a church. And hey, that's still time. pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I didn't have, like, I, I was excited to get it out there and I believe in the message. And we took some of the blog ideas and, it's my writing. I wrote the book, but I hired an editor to say, okay, stitch these 80 posts into like a coherent idea scheme. And she did. 
Darcy Clemens is her name. She was brilliant. She gave me back an amazing first draft. I rewrote it. And within three months, we had a book. I mean, that's like, that's like microwaving. A yeah, book. that's crazy. great. But, um, you know, and I, I believe in all the principles, but like we didn't have particularly high hopes for the book. It was like, okay, this is a new product. We got it to market. It's going to help leaders. That's great. But it sold like crazy for a book you can't buy in bookstores too. You can only buy it online or at orange events or from the orange store. So it's, it's, it's done way better than anybody thought. I think we sold 15,000 copies, 16,000 in the first eight months, which is like, that's, that's awesome. pretty good in today's market. So, uh, and then we got all these questions about like, how, like, can you come to our church and teach this stuff? And so after the book came out and it had that great launch, um, I just thought, well, you know, I have to say no to most speaking requests, even though I have more time for that, they still outweigh my time available. And, you know, it's expensive to fly a speaker in. So why don't I just record my best thoughts on the book and you can use it as like uh, a teaching curriculum for your team. So kind of like a small group study for leaders where, okay, everybody read chapter four, you gather together for your team discussion. Uh, now you got a video where I recap the top ideas where I add some stuff that isn't in the book and I set your team up to have the discussion. So I did that for every chapter in the book plus a bonus chapter that isn't in the book, um, an intro on how to lead team dynamics. And that's available and that's done really well as well. So, um, you know, that was just a hope that on a very affordable scale, every church would be able to even better facilitate these great discussions with their relevant teams, whether that's elder board, staff, or whoever it was. So that's available as well. It's all at lastingimpactbook.com if people want more. Yeah, and I, obviously I have the book. I've read it. I have not used the Team Edition videos yet, but I do have them, and we plan to use them. But I want to talk about some of the conversations there. I imagine some of the popularity of it was your platform probably had grown, so maybe that's part of it. But I think a big part of it is it just hit felt needs. I mean, every yeah. one of those conversations was like most church leaders are thinking, yep, I'm dealing with that. Tell me what you know, because you can't go find another book about it. It's, well, I hope so. You know, those are all the conversations, Nick, the way I looked at it, that we all know we need to have, yeah. but nobody, nobody really knows how to have them or you, you, you want to have them, but you just haven't set aside the time to have them. And we had pretty much had all those conversations around Conexus and I'm having those conversations with other church leaders. So I thought, well, if I just put this in book form, then somebody's got, you know, 3,000, 4,000 words to read on why people are attending church less often, frame the issue, and then you can figure out how to respond in your own context. So it's more a descriptive book than a prescriptive book. It doesn't tell you how to solve the issue, but it shows you what, issue, what issues are, how they need to be solved, and then it sets you up so that you can figure out how to solve them in your personal context. Yeah, if you had all the descriptive things or prescriptive, like how to solve the problems, then it would probably have sold millions of copies and you'd, you'd be a billionaire because there's some tough problems in those conversations. Well, there you go. You know, that's <laughs> what I should have done. Yeah, yeah. If you could just figure that out. I'm sure it's easy. You figure that out. You, you know, one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten from the book is thank you for not giving us simple answers yeah. because I think people are done with simple answers and everybody needs to figure out what works in their context. Now, obviously, I have a bias and I pretty much reveal what we did about those issues or what I think is a good course of action. But it's not like if you disagree with me, you can't use the book. You can definitely use the book. Sure. And I imagine part of it too is church leaders are so busy, they almost need the excuse to have the conversation. The fact that you had them at Conexus just shows good leadership and you're making time to talk about things that are important, but not maybe urgent, right? Well, so. yeah, yeah, I hope so. And what's fun is you get to bring another guy in the room and make him the bad guy. So I can be the bad guy. You can say, what is he talking about? And just, you know, yeah. And, and that's what I, I'm a firm believer in having other voices speak into your ministry and your context. And, you know, we hire consultants and we bring people in and we get fresh perspectives. And so book is a very economical way to do that. And if that's helpful to leaders, I'm gra grateful. Yeah. And we want to hit, I want to hit a few of them with you kind of with the family ministry lens on filter on it, even though I know that's not your context, but one of them, like you mentioned, is people attending less frequently. And for us, I know the best way we can see that is children's ministry because we check kids in. So we know exactly how often and every church leader I talk to, um, it seems like the average kid attends a little less than half the time. It's like 47% yeah. or something it seems very common. So uh, what did you, what have you learned about that kind of in the book? What are some ways that you're seeing churches maybe wrestle with that? 
Yeah, well, this is this is something I started picking up on probably six or seven years ago. I mean, you know, if you've followed Rick Warren for a while, he's been talking about declining church attendance. What I'm talking about here is not like unchurched people not coming. I'm talking about people who say, hey, we're in at your church, Nick. We love your church, but we just don't come very much. And so a family that used to come every Sunday now might come twice a month, or a family that came twice a month might come once a month or every two months now. And so you know, as I started to ask my friends about it, I'm not like a researcher with Gallup in my back pocket, but just I talk to mega church leaders. I talk to large church leaders, small church leaders, um, you know, house churches almost. I've talked to mainline Bible churches, evangelical, uh, contemporary, traditional. Every, it's a universal trend. It's a cultural shift that's happening so that even people who love your church, like they just don't show up that much. And I think kids ministry people and student ministry people are super positioned to track this better than anybody, because even with giving data, giving, you know, a decade ago, giving was a good indication about whether you were there or not on Sunday, because the plate passed around and 90 percent of everything that the church took in happened on a Sunday. So you would know if so-and-so hadn't been writing checks for a while or there was no attributed gift in an envelope from, you know, the new Hoffs. The new house probably weren't around. Yeah. Now you don't know. I could give every single week to a church, but you wouldn't know whether I was there. So the only time you actually, you know, unless you start putting microchips in people, um, the only time you know whether people are there or not is by tracking kids' attendance, which also gives you a really like if you're a church leader listening to this who doesn't know how like that figure you just gave of 47 percent, if you don't know that number for your church, you need to figure that out. And the only way you can track it pretty much these days is through kids ministry or the best way you can track it is through kids and student ministry numbers. Yeah, that's true. And then you can, obviously it's not going to be exact, exact, but uh, just assume that the whole church is similar, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And actually I would suggest that probably your children's attendance might be disproportionately higher and more regular than other attendance. True. Here's yeah. why. When you get to the empty nest stage and you don't have kids anymore, a lot of, you know, couples, and we're at that stage. Well, it's not that you don't have kids anymore. What, yeah. what do I, they yeah. don't live in at the house. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you forget you have children when you're at the empty nest stage. That's Sometimes okay. you want to forget you have children. You want to forget you have children. <laughs> That's right. That's when they're toddlers. Then you yeah, want to forget. Exactly. But, you know, a, a lot of couples will use that freedom and just say, hey, let's go away for the weekend or let's go visit friends. And so... I think you actually see attendance decline. This is just anecdotal, but I wouldn't be surprised if it declines as a family gets older and even as the kids get more um, independent. So I think particularly, you know, once once a child is sort of in that predictable phase of maybe 18 months to six or seven years old, I think you might get some of the most regular church attendance you get out of people in that window. And the reasons, Nick, you had asked about that earlier are um, people don't feel guilty like they used to. I mean, if you're really reaching unchurched people, it's I always compare it to going to the gym. You know, I, I don't really like the gym, so I give myself points if I go once a month. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the guys who are working out every day, they kind of look down on people like us. It's like, once a month, you know, I'm here once a day, <laughs> right? I'm like, well, okay, I'm there once a month. But I give myself points. Yeah. So if you've never gone to church all your life and you show up once a month, you think you're doing great, Yeah. right? And, and so it's just, it's a different paradigm. Um, sports are a big deal now. Sunday used to be a quiet day. Now it's a very busy day. Um, travel and, and I know everybody feels like they're getting poor, but the reality is we have more disposable income than at any point in history. And like people used to take an annual vacation. I don't know if this is true in Maryland, Nick, but like where we are, people are taking three, four, five vacations a year. Oh, and yeah, even definitely. micro vacations, you know, it's like, well, we're going camping this weekend or, hey, we're going to be away at a friend's cottage or, uh, yeah, we're going to Cuba. Didn't you just get back from Alaska? OK, you yeah. know, but but that that's what people do. And, and they don't feel bad about missing a Sunday. And you've got online church. So now they have online options and they're like, well, we listen to Andy Stanley. So we went to church. Yeah, that, that's the same thing. Yeah. Were you at church? I don't know. So all that is combining into this. And then what we're trying to track, even since the book released, I was talking to a leader of a very large church actually this week about it, is the whole attendance engagement thing. You know, that one of the best ways, I think, to drive attendance is through increased engagement. So back in the day, as in 10 years ago, up until about a decade ago, I just thought the way to drive engagement for people to really become 
engaged in the mission was to just grow a larger attendance. So, you know, if you had a thousand people, you would have more people engaged in the Christian faith than if you had a hundred people. Um, if you had 5,000 people, you'd even, you'd have even more engaged. But in an era of declining attendance and declining regularity, um, I, I think, you know, right now we have 2,500 people who call our church home. I think 20 years ago that would have produced an attendance of 18 or 1900. Today it produces an attendance of about 1200 on the weekend. So if I'm relying on growing attendance to drive engagement, I'm going to be sorely disappointed. So what I'm thinking, and, and this church leader agrees, is flip it. In other words, don't worry about attendance, worry about engagement and drive engagement. Because who will attend in the future church? Engaged people. If you're really engaged in the mission, if you're giving, if you're serving, if you want your kids to know Jesus, if you're inviting your neighbors, if you're plugged into the community through groups, you're going to show up more often than the person who sits in the back row and yawns and isn't engaged in any other way. So rather than just trying to drive attendance, we are thinking through how do we drive engagement? How do we get people to serve? How do we get people into community? How do we get people to invite their friends? How do we, how do we make sure that people understand that they are the mission, that the church isn't the mission, that they are the church. They don't go to church. They are the church. And how do we engage them in that faith so that the church kind of becomes a, a rallying point, a gathering point, ascending even more than a gathering so th- those are some of the things we're thinking of and other church leaders are thinking of to try to combat um, the problems we're seeing. with. Because at the end of the day, whether, you know, whether people come once a month or whether they come every three months, that isn't really the issue. The issue is, are they growing in their relationship with Jesus or are they drifting in their relationship with Jesus? Are they becoming more effective in their faith walk or less effective? Are they, are they actually growing in their devotion Are they not growing in their devotion? I want people who are growing in their devotion to Christ. Now, well, I've heard you talk about, um, because there's so many ways I'm sure you could share some wisdom about how you're driving engagement. And I I know some of that is through social media or just communications, making sure uh, content is reshared and available all the time and you're hitting people where they are. But I've heard you share sometimes your number of volunteers at the church and the average attendance. And I happen to know it's very high, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very high. So that's obviously something you're doing. That's, I heard, uh, we both know Tony Morgan and he has said to me one time that, well, it makes sense that the more volunteers you have, the more the church grows because they're more engaged. They invite more, they attend more frequently. Um, what do you think? I know we could talk about that forever, but have you seen volunteers and, and helping people become volunteers as a way to help them engage? Yeah, I'll share something with you that I've been talking about with a few church leaders that I haven't really talked about much publicly. Exclusive um, coming here. This exclusive. Is no, it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> like, I'm not even sure I believe it, but I think I believe it. And it's sort of unorthodox. But if somebody said, I only have time to either join a group or to serve in the mission to volunteer, what should I do? I think I would tell them to ignore group and serve. When I look at the healthiest people in our church, and again, I'm using Connexus as a, as a lab, all right? But when I look at the people that I go, wow, they're on fire. They love Jesus. You know, over time, everybody's got, you know, twists and turns and issues in their life and so on. But over time, on a three to five year window, I see them bearing more fruits of the Holy Spirit. I see them uh, more closely devoted to Jesus than they were a few years ago. When I look at that consistently, again and again, the common denominator is those people are serving. And if they're really healthy, they're inviting their friends. And if they're really excellent. They're also giving because, you know, my, your treasure shows where your heart is. Yep. So if all your money is going everywhere but the kingdom of God, that's a spiritual issue. That's not a financial issue. And so when people are, are three out of four, I, and they're all outward focused. They're all like, when I serve, it's not about me, right? I am trying to make your day better. I'm trying to make somebody else's day better. When I give, I'm actually giving something up for the sake of somebody else. When I invite a friend, I'm taking a risk and I'm outward focused. Those three are outward focused. I think sometimes, I don't think great community in our church, but I think like average community in our church can often become myopic and, and, and self-focused. So I know too many community groups. Now, again, great leadership can combat this where it's about, you know, well, how much do you know about the Bible or, you know, this is really church for us. We don't really need the church, you know, because very insular and very isolating 
and that's not healthy. So I think this is the, the, the unorthodox answer. Uh, if somebody said, I only have time to serve or be in community group, I'd say, okay, serve, because I think they'll be healthier. I think they will own the mission. I think they'll be more engaged. And I think that they will die to themselves and live to something bigger themselves than themselves more than if they were just in small group. Yeah, that's good. I totally agree. You know, what's funny. Our church in some ways was missing it a little bit because if you talk about like a path of discipleship or steps that people take to become more involved and, and grow in their faith, we had some really clear steps to help you get in a group. We weren't so clear on the steps to serve until years so ago good. when we realized, hey, if we run the numbers, half the people go in group next and half of them serve next, yet we're not helping them serve at all next. Right. And so wow. now we've started to do that and it's, it's been really good. We're focusing more and helping people take those steps to serve. Can I add a caveat to what I said to of course. just, of course, this is a family ministry next gen podcast. I do not believe that about kids small groups. I'm talking about adults here. Oh, sure. Yeah. You, you I, kids I, small I groups. think, I think there's something inherently selfless about student small groups and children's ministry small groups. And, you know, we, we don't really give kids a choice. I mean, if you come to Connexus, you're in a group. Like, yeah, it's not like you get to opt in or opt out. Yeah. And I know a lot of your listeners, a lot of leaders would be in the same boat. But I think, I think what's wonderful about children's ministry small groups and student ministry small groups is that the small group leaders are actually not in it for themselves. My goodness, if you spent more than 10 minutes in a small group with kids or students, you are clearly not in it for yourself. Yeah. There's a, there's an element of sacrifice and there's an element of like giving to the next generation. So I'm talking about, I think even with young adult small groups, most of the people in our small group right now, my wife and I are under 30. And so, you know, it's still a season where they're developing, where they're cementing their beliefs about God and the world. I think, I think that's a different context. I'm talking about, you know, people 35 plus who are sort of in the prime of their life going, yeah, this is all about me. Eh, no, it's not. Yeah. So I'd I mean rather have you serve. But you would also probably agree, too, that um, the importance of that serving thing starts like in middle school, and really high school. Yes. I mean, because I know your church is big on that. We're big on that. That if you were missing the serving piece, that would affect them. That might keep them. I don't know if this is true, but I think it keeps them, them in church more than anything else. I, it does. And it keeps the faith. It keeps their faith. I think. Uh, yeah, it keeps their faith a lot more solid. We see that the kids who do best usually are the kids who definitely are in group. But the kids who start to lead sometimes at a very young age, we we let I don't even know the number at Connexus, but we will let children start serving. I think upstreet kids serve in Wombaland, like oh, elementary awesome. kids serve in preschool. It's ridiculously young. Uh, and I think that's great because they're learning at an early age. It's not about them. The other thing that is is really transformative for kids is obviously the serving um, and group. But but. Um, a camp experience. Like if they yeah. go away for a week, um, intentionally for spiritual formation. And we do that through summer camps. Um, those are the kids. They do mission work. Like they serve, they are in a group and they do, um, you know, some kind of camping over the summer. That's Christian based. Those are the kids we consistently see do the best. Yeah, they were huge for me. I always tell people if I pick, if I told you the top, I grew up in church ever, attending ever, ever since I was two years old. But if I told you the top five things that grew my faith, they would either involve a, a student trip or serving. And Isn't that something? And all of them were from like fourteen to twenty. And and if it weren't for those things, I don't you know I don't know what, what would be. I always look back to that time my youth pastor asked me to serve on the team when I was twenty. Then so I was out of the ministry, and I just think I don't know what. Where I would have been had he never asked, you know, because it just hadn't come to mind. If I had just been at that time, I was in a Sunday school class. If I had just been there, I don't know, you know how. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm grateful you were, um, but I think Care Powell would say too. It's in the context of serving and mission and working with other adults and even being in a space like camp where you've got you know space for six days, five days to really have dialogue where people's doubts can come to the surface because as Kara Powell says, it's not doubt that's toxic to faith. It's unexpressed doubt. And in the context of that intergenerational conversation, kids ask their questions, you know, it's not a program. They just, they just get to know someone who's sort of at a different stage in their life. And I think that's very healthy. Definitely. So again, the more you pour coal, the more you pour fuel on those things, 
the deeper engagement is going to become at your church. And the deeper engagement becomes, the greater attendance will become because engaged people attend more. Yeah, that's good. And some of that we talked on there even touches on a, one of the other conversations about young people missing from the church. But I want to talk about uh, one of them is recruiting high capacity leaders. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything you could ask that a children's leader or a student leader needs, it's more volunteers. And if they mm-hmm. got real specific, they'd probably say, I need high capacity leaders to help me get some more other volunteers. So what have you learned about that? How does Connexus seem to do that well, or at least try to do that well? Well, we've done it well and we've done it poorly. So I've done both. Um, but when we've done it well, this is what we do. Number one, don't downplay the challenge. High capacity leaders love a significant challenge and you just need to be willing and able uh, to really paint the mission in as compelling terms as you can. One of the fun points of my new job is Jeff Brody sends me documents he's working on like vision documents and strategy documents. And like now it's fun because I, I just get to make them bolder. I'm like, oh, you should be stronger here. And he's like, well, I thought it was pretty strong. I'm like, ah, be stronger. And I That's felt the timidity in that sometimes yeah. when I was a lead pastor and I understand his reticence. It's like, is this too much? Like, nah, just go for it. But, you know, I really believe in our mission and I really believe in his leadership. And I think high capacity leaders respond to high levels of challenge. And so often we, we, we soft pedal the challenge. I mean, the church, the church has the biggest mission in the entire planet. There is nothing more important on planet Earth than what we're doing day in and day out in the local church. I sincerely believe that. I really believe with Bill Hybels that the local church is the hope of the world. And often we don't treat it that way. So we stand up and we apologize for like, well, you probably don't want to serve in student ministry and, you know, you don't want to be in the, in, in, in the nursery. And so, you know, we'll only make you serve once every 25 weeks. And, you know, I'm sorry, we shouldn't. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No high capacity leader is going to step up for an apology like that. But if you say, man, I want to introduce you to an opportunity to do the most significant thing you can do with your life, and that's invest in the life of a child, invest in the life of a student. And let me tell you why it matters. And you tell some personal stories and you tell people, hey, this is like, this is not for wimps. This is high challenge. We're going to ask you to give every single week of the next 40 weeks to these kids. Now we understand once in a while you're going to be away. We get that. But like we're asking you to serve every single week. And the reason we are is they need a consistent voice saying the same thing a loving parent would say. And frankly, we need people who are going to invest in the next generation, even spend some time during the week. So it might be more than Sunday morning, but we think you're up to it. Are you in there? Yeah. And if someone like me is like, oh, I'm in, right? I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it sounds like it's a lot, but the pay, the return is more than worth it, right? Absolutely. But, which is a different sales pitch than we really need help over here. We're kind of dying in a pile. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it easy for you by doing it every four weeks. Oh gosh, desperation is just not attractive to anybody. You yeah. know, desperate people dating is really bad. Um, you know, desperate True. people in church, <laughs> like it's really bad. You just you and and you may be desperate, but don't go to your desperation. Go go to a place of inspiration, not desperation. That's good. And you obviously connects this church from the beginning, I'm sure has been like this, but if you reach all the way back into the early days of leading in your church, you would easily say, cause a lot of, ch- I'm thinking of children's ministry specifically here. There's a lot of children's ministry leaders through sheer necessity. Maybe they only have one service or, or maybe it's just, that's the way it was when they came in. Leaders lead once a month. Um, I've heard of like they serve every week for a month, but then they're off for a month or every other week or something like that. But looking back, would you say, oh yeah, it's definitely worth the challenge and worth the risk to call people to serve weekly because you might lose some people, right? I would if I, yeah, I would if I was starting again. I mean, we've introduced the weekly thing more in the last five to 10 years than we did in the first decade because um, I didn't know about it yeah. <laughs> until yeah. five to 10 years ago. So we've definitely made that transition. And I, if I was starting over again today, I would I'd definitely go for that. But, you know, I, did, I just think you have to have a passion. Like, I didn't have a whole lot of strategy. I'd never heard of Reggie Joyner when, you know, Orange, when I was starting in 1995. I mean, North Point was just actually starting. They hadn't even developed what yeah. they were doing. Yeah. But, you know, there was just an urgency. It's like, we got to go reach people. We got to build into the next generation. Come on. Yep. You know, I remember the first year, you know, the, the average attendance at one of the churches was six, another was 14, and the third, the big mega church, 
was 23. 23. And, <laughs> and we didn't have any kids. We had like five kids stapled together between all three churches. Mm. And I said to them, we're going to do a vacation Bible camp. And they said, well, we, we, we don't have any kids. I said, the reason you don't have any kids is because you don't have a vacation Bible camp. So let's do it. Come on. And so literally I started in May. In July, we held three vacation Bible camps, one week at each church. It was crazy. Wow. Did we have the capacity to do it? No, we didn't have the capacity to do it. Did we have any money? No, we didn't have any money, but we did it anyway. And like 80 or 90 kids showed up, and all of a sudden there were 30 kids in September. Wow. Uh, more than, you know, two of the churches put together. So, and I'm like, well, now that we've had a vacation Bible camp, we need, at that time, we called it Sunday school classes. And they're like, well, we don't have any classes. We don't have any teachers. I said, the reason you don't have any classes, you don't have any teachers, that's why you don't have any kids. So come on, let's build it. Uh, and so we, you know, set some space aside and we bought a curriculum and I recruited teachers. And sure enough, guess what? When you build it, they came. And I don't think it was because we added, we were just passionate about it. And if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is John Wesley, you know, light a man on fire and people will come for miles to watch him burn. And that's true of men or women. But, you know, where's your passion? If you're, if you're not passionate for the next generation, of course, you're going nowhere. And children and student leaders listening obviously love that you were pushing this family ministry focus, reaching kids, reaching students as a pastor, which is great. And one of the, I want to shift gears here kind of at the end just to talk about a different topic. And that's how children and student leaders can best work with their leader, their pastor, serve their pastor. Sure. I think most of the time we're asking, most of them would want, some of them, if there's if there's something they don't like, they want to just, hey, can I get Kerry Newhoff? I know he's a pastor who loves family ministry. He champions it. He would support it. You know what I mean? And maybe they've never asked the question, what can I do to help serve my pastor, lead my pastor, do this in, in a good way? So I would just love to pick your brain a little bit about what do you wish uh, some of the staff you've led, probably mostly in children's student ministry, what do you wish they knew from your perspective, oh. from your seat? You know, a couple of things. Um, one is don't assume the senior leader has as much autonomy as you think. I mean, a lot of people are that's, just like, I'll just get you to buy in. But like when you're in the senior leader chair, and I was there for 20 years, you, I mean, you have an elder board, you've got budget concerns, you've got um, you know, staffing issues and you as a senior leader probably know things that the rest of the staff don't know. Like this person's thinking of leaving or, Hey, this is going on and I can't tell you about it. So really show deference and respect to the senior leader. And, you know, don't, don't think that the reason they might say no is just because they don't like you or they don't want to. Uh, the reality is much more complex than that. I was having a conversation on leading up uh, last week with Dan Ryland. And he's the executive pastor at 12 Stone. We were talking about it. He said something that, like, I'd never heard anyone say out loud, but it totally, like, you know, you hear one of those insights. It's like, of course, this has been going on in the background throughout my leadership. He said, he said, be good at your job. Like, if you're <laughs> bad at your job and you go to your senior leader and you ask for something, your senior leader, it's like, you're an idiot. That's yeah. what they're thinking. That's you funny. Know? That's like, true. I, I learned a new, uh, oh, no, never mind. I was reading in Proverbs today. Proverbs nineteen twenty nine says, "The back of fools was made for beating." <laughs> There's something to Instagram. Yeah, anyway, I quoted That's that to my wife this morning. She didn't think that was a good idea to go public with that. That wasn't encouraging. Yeah, That's you can edit that out. But there's there's truth. I mean, if you're no good at what you do, your leader isn't going to listen to you. If you're, but if you're killing it, if you're crushing it, if you've got passion and you're skilled and you're competent, you've already got authority when you walk in the room. And I said, Dan, of course, like that just makes a lot of sense. Cause he was talking about, guess who he had to lead up to John Maxwell. John Maxwell. Yeah. John Maxwell. Yeah. Just be easy. And John doesn't suffer fools lightly. So Dan is like, one of the ways I get John's attention is I do a really good job at my job. Yeah. And if I do a really good job, John pays attention to me. And if I don't do a good job, he doesn't pay attention to me. So like I would say, are you doing a great job? Are you? And, and, and the other thing I would add to that, and Dan, I, I was so grateful. That's like, that just makes so much sense. And I'm so glad he talked about that. The other thing I would say is think cross organizationally. Like, don't just go in with your little kids men thing, your little student ministry thing, your little, you know, service programming thing or whatever you got. Like, the senior leader is responsible for the entire organization. And so when you ask for $10,000, he's already had three other requests for $10,000 that month. 
or he's thinking, well, I could use that $10,000 here. I was going to spend it here. And again, you don't know what's going on in his or her head, but like think cross organizationally and pitch in beyond your boundaries from time to time. So in other words, last year you gave $5,000, even though you're in Kidsman to the student ministry people or the student ministry gave people gave $5,000 to the Kidsman people or to the small groups people or to the creative arts people. When they see that kind of like, Hey, we're all in this together. You know, we're all in on the whole mission. That is very, very attractive and very persuasive. And, and I've heard Sue Miller say this before as we've talked about this. Do your homework. Just do your homework. I mean, she had a lead up to Bill Hybels. And again, you know, easy. Bill, she, like, sure yeah, it's easy. just really easy to do. <laughs> so, you know, she said, I had to make sure I did my homework because he would ask me 30 questions. And I had to make sure I knew the depth. So, I mean, I think competence really helps. You better be good at your job. And, and I would say for me, like what I'm, what I'm thinking when you walk into my office, Nick, what I'm thinking is basically when you walk in, do I trust this guy? Yeah. And I've already kind of made up my mind because if you're the kind of person I trust and you ask for something, I'm probably going to say yes. And if you're the problem where I'm all, or you're the person, if you're the problem, Freudian slip, if you're the <laughs> person where I'm always looking over your shoulder, where you never hit your budget numbers, where the information you give me isn't accurate, where I know you're probably not really working 40 hours a week, then I'm probably, because we're human, I've probably decided no already just when you walk in to ask or you shoot me that email. Um, so you want to make sure that that when you walk in the room, you walk in and they respect you. Yeah, and you obviously have to earn that right over time. But doing it's all earned. the things you said, just doing your job well. And I would imagine, too, I could see I see this in. I'm sure it's true in children and student world, but it's more in children's ministry because most children's ministry happens with the service. So a lot of times a children's pastor could be uh, almost a thorn in the side because every time a new idea or something that needs to be changed or done comes up, the children's person just wants to complain about how that's going to negatively affect children's ministry, which at times it could be true. But right. right, with that was a union mindset. It's yeah. like, you know, not in my backyard or don't, don't do that here. Or this is how this impacts me. And, Honestly, senior leaders can't afford to think that way. And we have to think about the entire organization. And ironically, if you think about the entire organization, guess what? Children's ministry is probably going to do better. Student ministry is probably going to do better. Yeah, because you would trust a leader who thinks about with the whole church. You say that in the book. Think like a senior leader. Think with the whole church in mind. Your trust would grow if somebody was doing that, if they were putting the whole church first, not just their ministry. I default to Andy Stanley's definition of trust, and it's very simple. Trust is confidence. Like, yeah. do I have the confidence that you're going to do? You're going to be a great steward of whatever I give you. And and honestly, I mean, I think most leaders do this. We kind of play favorites. There are some people, if they ask for something, ninety nine times out of a hundred, I'm just going to say yes, whether we have the money or not, whether. Um, I even understand the idea or not because I have full confidence in them and I trust them. And even though I may not fully understand it, if you think it's a good idea, I'm sure it's a good idea. So go for it. And then there are other people where it's going to have to be a really persuasive case because, you know, I, I don't have the level of confidence I should in you. Yeah, that's good. Has there, are there any moments? I know this is like off the cuff here, but are there any moments where you experienced uh, frustrations leading someone on your team who wasn't doing some of these things or the positive. Somebody came to you and tried to lead up in a way and it, it was good. It worked. And, and oh it yeah. We could learn from it. I mean, you all, everybody goes through several rounds of staffing and a lot of this is, is growth as a leader, but yeah, I can remember meetings where, you know, I was trying to get someone to be strategic and they had a really good ministry. It was growing actually. It was quite large, but it was based on sort of a Pied Piper mentality and a great leader, like a really great leader, but like would not, would only have his strategy, would not think about the strategy, of the overall church. And ultimately, you know, that didn't work out in the end, but that was incredibly frustrating for me because as I was trying to lead the church, he was only thinking student ministry and we could never sync up. So that was, that was frustrating or people who just, you know, didn't know. You can see everybody like sometimes when your church is growing, and I mean, we grew from six to now, you know, 1200. So we've been through a few phases as a church. And sometimes people are ideal for like when the church was two to 300, but they just can't function at the 600 level or they were great for 600. But, you know, that thousand barrier is really tough to break and, and they just couldn't get through it. And you kind of realize that a season is coming to an end. And so 
you know, th- those have been frustrating moments where you're thinking, wow, you know, we've kind of outgrown, you've outpunted your coverage. So what are we going to do with that? Those, those have been frustrating times. In terms of great things, yeah, trust is confidence. About a decade ago, I started to take operations really seriously. About a decade ago, we were 600, 700, maybe. Yeah, about that. And I just realized, even though I don't like operations, we needed operations. I mean, our accounting system had to be buttoned down, pressed, you know, audit proof, bullet proof. And I don't like that. I mean, I'm, I'm just like, I, I know it needed to be done. So I started hiring people who were really good at that stuff. And they got my confidence. Jeff Brody, obviously, who's the new lead pastor, you know, he was in student ministry. He was a student guy and was a really, I remember having a call with one of our elders, now one of my mentors, David McDaniel. And I was looking for sort of a right-hand person. And he just said, well, looking across your whole staff, who do you think could do it? And I said, well, you know, because this was an operations role. And I'm like, well, Jeff could, but he's in student ministry for life. And he goes, why don't you take him out for lunch to ask him? I'm like, David's always got great advice. I'm like, okay, I will. Yeah. So I took Jeff out and I said, hey, I know you're into student ministry for life. You're never leaving. But he was like 35 at the time. I'm like, how about it? You want to come and work with me and do operations and he had his personality test done and his right path done. And apparently they said, don't ever touch a budget. But I said, well, I just think you can do it. And he <laughs> did. He did an unbelievable job. He led our building campaign. Um, I did the whole fundraising visioning part, but like he ran the day-to-day operations of it and brought it in on time under budget. And, and the building's a showcase, as, as you've seen it. Oh, I mean, it he's it's an amazing. standing job for the money and the square footage we had. It was just, I, I mean, you know, it's nice as a leader to walk around and go, gosh, how am I even like associated with this? They, he, he just did a fantastic job. And, you know, so it was an easy call for me when it was like, okay, I think I need a new role. I think this is a new season for us um, to just say to the elders, and this is the secret of Jeff's transition. He didn't even interview for the job. I just said, I think Jeff should be the new lead pastor. And he'd been at the elders table for three or four years as the operations guy. And there, you know, we took three meetings to pray about it and was like, yep, Jeff's a new lead pastor. So that was it. So, and that's what confidence brings. It was just every time I gave him something, my confidence in him grew and it continues to grow in this new role. And, you know, that's competency. It's also character. Um, You know, we know each other really well and I I trust him implicitly. And I think, I think trust operates in the church world, Nick, on two levels. Um, It operates on... You know, would I give you the keys to my house? Would I, would I give you the pin to my bank card? Um, and, and, you know, to even get hired on staff, I probably trust people, you know, not that I give away the pin to my bank card or not that that would be particularly lucrative. But if I did, you know, I mean, I trust a lot of people at that level, like here's key to my house, here's key to my car, you know, <laughs> you know, I drive my wife here, you know, you know, take my kids, whatever. Like I, I trust people at that level. But that doesn't mean I have trust in their ability to do a job. That doesn't mean like they may be completely trustworthy on, you know, here's $500, give it back to me in a a week or whatever. They're totally trustworthy in that, but they're just not competent or they're not in the right area. And so I think when you get the combination of what I call personal trust and then competency trust, that's when you've got a leader that you can kind of bet the future on. And obviously that's what Jeff was or is for me. I've had numerous other leaders uh, around me over the years, like Sarah Piercy, my assistant, Justin Piercy, your husband, you know, and there are others, Shauna, our kids men director, and many others on staff that, that just have that level of trust where it's like, man, you guys, like, we just trust you organizationally. We trust you personally. And that's the winning combination. Yeah. And so for, for us listening, that's, that's the goal. Earn that trust, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know. Yeah. And, and one is like, be that person, right? Be trustworthy on a personal level. Yep. And then the other is, hone your craft. Don't just rely on your gift, like become, you know, as Jim Collins has said many times, best in the world at what you do or best at something. Yeah, that's good. Man, I could talk about this forever. Even the growth barrier thing you were talking about, the operations and breaking a thousand, I could spend just an hour just picking your brain about that because it's so (laughs) intriguing. And just the idea that like, what if a rollout grows you? That's so common in a church. And something, but sometimes I think we could develop uh, ourselves to to grow with the church or even our, our team. And so, man, I could just talk about that forever, but unfortunately the time is up. Um, well, and that's one of the joys of a larger organization too. When you're a small church, you know, and you have three staff or you have no staff or half a staff or something, 
you don't have room to keep moving people, but you get to our stage and like, you know, now for the first time we can afford a teaching pastor and a founding pastor. Well, I can do that. Like that, that actually plays to my strength. When I look at what, what God uses most in my leadership, it's my ability to communicate. Look, look at what I'm doing with my life. I write, that's communication, (laughs) you know, a blog, books, I, I podcast. And I speak. I speak at conferences and I speak at our church 35 times a year. Um, I'm a communicator. That's what I am, who also happens to lead through communication. But I also know that operations becomes really important and our organization is becoming more complex. That's more Jeff's wheelhouse. Um, he can take it to places I wasn't interested in taking it, to be honest with you, because I want to play, I want to play in my lane which is communications. And so what happens as you grow is you become more and more of a specialist. A younger yeah. church, smaller church, everybody's got to be a generalist, but you become more and more of a specialist and you can afford to start specializing at that stage. And if you've got volunteers, you know, that's that's the joy of it is you can find somebody and this person's only really good at relationships, but they're amazing at relationships. So I'll just have them do relationships. And with a volunteer, that's great. You can afford that. And then you can have someone else. Well, you organize the retreat and make sure all the permission forms are signed and all the parents are contacted and the bus arrives on time and shows up on time. So you can specialize with that. But at a senior leader level, you got to do that with staff eventually. Yeah. And I feel like we're there too, because we're a little bit, your church is a little over a thousand, right? We're, the, we're in a similar place. And I feel like we need even more of that to continue growing and oh, totally. getting the barriers out of the way. Cause we have been generalists forever. Like you, we yeah. were a church plant. So you do like a million things, you know, in the early days. You have to. That. Yeah. So, totally. and I was graphic design for a while. I ran the projector. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what projector we have anymore. Yeah. And you don't miss those days at all. I'm sure. You know, there are days where, like, I want to get into the weeds, and then I'm like, ah, no, I don't. No, I don't. Yeah, that's true. Well, Carrie, thanks so much for taking this time. It's been it's been great. We could talk about this stuff forever. And I just I know I speak for everyone when I say your influence, your communication, like you talked about, have been really helpful for me over the years to help me grow as a leader. And so, thank you for doing what you do and, and keep up that awesome stuff. How can people connect with you? They want to learn some more and yeah. Uh, you can go to my blog. It's just my name, kerrynewhoff.com. It's so easy to spell. Yeah, simple. Want me to spell simple. it out? <laughs> C-A-R-E-Y-N-I-E-U-W-H-O-F. See? That's yeah, really simple. Totally. If you even totally misspell it, uh, Google will find it. That's how unique it is. Google's so, so smart. It is. kerrynewhoff.com. Uh, I got a podcast, Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And I'm on social either at cnewhoff or Kerry Newhoff um, on most channels. And Nick, can I just say... Thanks for doing what you're doing. I mean, I love, we've known each other for a few years, but I just love what you're doing in doing this podcast. And, you know, you've been blogging, I think before I was really seriously blogging and you built into a lot of church leaders and you're extremely well respected in your field. And I just want to say thank you so much for doing what you do. I really, really appreciate you personally. Well, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. I just try to help. And, and I have blogged for a long time, but I, and I didn't say this earlier, but I tell people don't read anything before like two years ago. <laughs> it took me that long to, to actually make it good. Like, don't you know, go in the archives. <laughs> a secret A secret is, like, all my old stuff, all my terrible posts are still there. Like, it goes back to 2007. It's hard to access. But if you, like, deep Google it, you can find some really bad posts I wrote, like, back to, like, nine years ago. Yeah, you can do that with me, too, but don't do it because... Oh, don't and do it. I, and sometimes people might sell that just to be fun or self-deprecating. It really is pretty bad. I deleted some of the ones that were, like, they didn't make any sense. Pat Flynn's podcast taught me to do that. Like they didn't fit the brand anymore, you know? Right. But, but some of the ones that just need a rewrite, they're, you know, they're still there. So it's taking a long I'll time. I'll go back and do that now. Like some of my posts, not once a week, but a couple times a month, I'll find an old one that got almost no traction, but had a really good idea. And then I'll rewrite it. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, so I love it. I mean, that's definitely, even when I started out in church, probably like you, those were my things that I felt God wanted me to do was to help do whatever I could to help other churches. Because... Um, I just want to help love to see other leaders thrive and churches grow and reach people who are not a part of any church. And so, you know, and plus the, the podcast thing is great though. Cause it's just like great learning for me, P- experts and people like yourself on the podcast that I get to learn from and everybody else gets to hear it as well. It's really cool. So that's one of the secrets. Yeah. I do a podcast cause I'm selfish. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I learn an awful lot too. Yep. Well, thanks Carrie. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thanks Nick. Kerry has really helped me grow as a leader, and I'm so grateful for his influence. I'm sure many of you are as well, and I'm so thankful that he took some time to come on the podcast and share with us. Here's some action items I had coming out of there. 
uh, notes that I took. One is obviously to get the book, right? Get the book, Lasting Impact. Uh, read through that and take your time. You know, s- spend time on each conversation. Talk about it with your team. Another action item would be to get the team edition videos. And uh, I have that, and they're great because you can watch those together and let that kind of drive the conversation, which is really, really helpful. Kerry talked about how we need to let engagement drive attendance instead of the opposite. It used to be that we would get people to attend and then we would help them engage. But instead, we need to find ways to help help them engage more. And because of that, they'll attend more, just like serving, for instance, volunteering. If we get them engaged in volunteering, well, they're going to show up and then they're going to attend more often, right? So one you know, action item would be to get a team together and think through what are some ways that we can help drive engagement. And if you go to the show notes, there's a link there to a post that Carrie wrote with some ideas for how to do that, which would be really helpful. Another action item is something that we didn't talk about because it wasn't finalized when we did the interview, but it is now and it's out. It's a new resource from Carrie called the High Impact Leader. Uh, it's a great resource. It's basically a way to learn how Carrie manages time, his productivity, his energy. Uh, I, at knowing Carrie, I can tell you, and you probably get this if you listen to his podcast, he is very, very productive. He manages his energy and his time and his commitments really well. And so there's a lot that we can learn from him. So that's out. If you're on the Orange Tour, if you're going to one of the Orange Tour stops somewhere around the country um, at this point, you know, you probably already know if you're going or not. They're for sale there, but you can also get them in the Orange Store. And we link to that in the show notes as well. So you can get all of that at nickblevins.com slash episode 23. And like I mentioned in the intro, you'll find a link in there for Church Stratup if you're interested in that. To make sure you never miss an episode, be sure to hit subscribe and iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, whatever it might be. In the next episode, I talk with Terrace Crawford, a youth ministry veteran. If you know you serve in youth ministry, I'm sure you know of Terrace. He has an awesome podcast called This Week in Youth Ministry. Terrace and I talk about the importance of helping students serve and what that can look like. What are some ways to do that in our churches? I think that's really important, and you don't want to miss that conversation with Terrace. So. Be sure to subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.